This is the Big 550 KTRS. I am Paul Harris filling in for McGraw again today. Thanks so much for listening. Later on in this hour, a new batch of knuckleheads in the news. And with the Oscars coming up on Sunday night, Colin Jeffrey will join me in studio. And we'll talk about the movies that deserve to win and the movies that we think will win. To start this hour, let me introduce you to Michael Weiss, who is a columnist for The Daily Beast and for Foreign Policy and has a great new book out now called ISIS, Inside the Armor of Terror, the the Army of Terror. This is uh, essentially the terrorist group that is in the news every day, all week long. Uh, we hear about their beheadings. We hear about the president saying it's not a, a religious battle. We're not in a holy war against ISIS. We're in a war against them as a terrorist group. And uh, Michael joins us live via Skype this morning. Welcome to the Big 550. Hey, thanks for having me on. So uh, one of the things you say in the introduction to the book is this book is personal. What do you mean? Right. Well, uh, my co-author is uh, Syrian, and not just Syrian. He comes from a town called Abu Kamal, which, uh, let's put it this way, if you were um, covering the Mexican drug cartel, it's like coming from Juarez. Uh, this is the gateway border town between Syria and Iraq. For almost a decade, jihadis coming in from in, landing in Syria would be would migrate across the eastern part of the country called the Jazeera, and then move through Abu Kamal uh, across the border into its uh, sister city Al Qaim in Iraq. Um, and now the traffic, of course, goes in reverse. The Iraqi jihadis are moving into Syria through that town. So, you know, Hassan has seen his country devoured by four years of attritional war. You know, the the brutality of the Assad regime to begin with, and now the brutality of ISIS. Um, for me, it's personal because I was covering Syria more or less since the inception of the uh, protest movement, which then became an armed rebellion. Um, I've reported from southern Turkey six times. I've been into Aleppo in the summer of 2012 and embedded with the Free Syrian Army, which then was the going fighting concern on the ground. Um, and the town I stayed in actually overnight is now completely ruled by ISIS, uh, including the safe house that I was in. They, they took that over and expelled the family that, that had lived there. So I've seen people, sources, people who became acquaintances and friends over the years um, who've been killed uh, or who have been dispossessed. So for both of us, we, we each have a kind of personal stake in this campaign and in uh, trying to defeat this this terrible organization. Okay, I, I want to kind of start with the debate over whether uh, ISIS is... Islamic terrorism. Uh, there yep. has been criticism of President Obama for not wanting to frame it in those terms. Uh, this week he said, we're, we're not having a holy war against Islam. He has said this many times before, but he really reiterated it this week. He said this is a war against a terrorist group, but it is not a group against a religious group. And yet, on the other side, you've got a, a piece that was written for The Atlantic by a journalist named Graham Wood that created right. a lot of controversy. And he says the Islamic State is Islamic, very Islamic. What's your take? Uh, the truth is somewhere in between, as it usually is. I mean, look, what the president said, there's nothing new there. Uh, I, I've been listening to both of his speeches at the Countering Violent Extremism Conference. I hear mostly platitudes and rhetoric, uh, very much of a piece with what George W. Bush said immediately after 9-11. We're not at war with Islam. That's correct. Um, and But to deny the Islamic caste or the Islamic component to ISIS I think is absurd. I mean, for, first and foremost, we still call them ISIS or ISIL. Uh, ISIL stands for the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. The president uses this, this terminology himself. So if they're not Islamic, why are we calling them the Islamic State? Right. I mean, this is something a child might figure out on his own. Um, <laughs> second, uh, it is absolutely the case that they are tapping into wellsprings of Islamic theology and Islamic history for the purposes of their propaganda. Um, the first sermon that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who, by the way, has a PhD in Islamic studies from a prominent university in Iraq, the first sermon he gave in Ramadan of last year was from the Al-Zangi Mosque in Mosul. Now, the sim symbolism of this mosque is quite powerful because um, this is where Salah Adin, the great Islamic warrior, used to preach before going off to fight the Second Crusades against, obviously, the Christian armies of, of the Middle East. Um, the, 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 the sort of nostalgia factor, if you like, and this goes back to the founder of ISIS, what was then known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, a man by the name of Abu Musa al-Zarqawi. He talked about uh, reconciling Mosul with Aleppo, because this, this again goes back to the period of the Abbasid Caliphate. So ISIS is absolutely using um, Islam as part of its marketing campaign, if you like. 
That said, uh, where I might take a little bit of issue with Graham's piece is if you look at the upper echelons of the group today, and it's true that you know there has been uh, transformations and evolutions because we've captured and killed a lot of the senior al-Qaeda in Iraq guys, but today, as it stands, a lot of the men standing behind Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi were former Ba'athists or Saddam uh, Hussein representatives of some kind. So you have Mukhabarat or intelligence operatives, you have Iraqi military soldiers, generals, uh, majors in some cases. Um, these guys went from being the secularist or the so-called secular, secularists of Ba'athist Iraq to being now Salafi jihadis. Now the question I have is, did they, do they sincerely believe their newfound faith? Or are they doing something else? And I think they they, they are doing something else um, because what ISIS is really trying to achieve at the political level is it, it is projecting itself as the custodians and the guarantors of Sunni supremacy in the region. So, and this goes back now to 2003 with the invasion of Iraq. Sunnis were knocked out of Baghdad. They had lived high on the hog through a patronage system set up by Saddam, even before Saddam, frankly. Um, and overnight, with the stroke of a pen because of debathification and then the disbandment of the Iraqi army, guys who were making, you know, the equivalent of millions of dollars a year, not through salaries, but through their black market economics and their extortion rackets, were essentially told, go drive a cab or operate a kebab cart and make your living that way. Right. So a lot of these guys wound up in the insurgency early on, and then the ones who haven't been captured or killed... Some of them who were captured actually were released by the Americans because they were deemed to, to be not really uh, significant security threats. They have undergone these transformations over time, and they have cast their lot, which is what with what is now today, the really only ideology and the only movement that sells in the Middle East. Pan-Arab nationalism, that's gone. Baathism, nobody's going to rise up on behalf of the Ba'ath Party in significant numbers. But Salafi jihadism, or takfirism, that is a powerful, powerful narrative. So ISIS is using... I mean, this is a cocktail sort of phenomenon. It's, it, it's no good to see them as just purely Islamic or purely Ba'athist. I mean, th there's, th they are a, a, a combination of different things. So there is Islamic fundamentalism. There's also a mafia component. Look at the way they make their money, smuggling oil, stealing precious artifacts from Syria and Iraq, selling those on the black market, um, allegedly now harvesting organs, um, you know, contraband of all sorts, weapons, you name it. Um, and, you know, but again, this is, this is going back to uh, a, a kind of broader regional uh, mission to put the Sunnis back on the throne because uh, they've been taken off it. And, you know, it, it, a lot of this has to do with what the Americans are perceived to be doing now with the Islamic Republic of Iran, which, of course, is a Shia country uh, or a Shia majority country. So geopolitics is playing a role in, in, in ISIS's recruitment efforts as well. Um, we have to take that into consideration. What about I one other part of this, Michael, that the president yeah. mentions, which is uh, poverty in that part of the world and, right. and young men who are easily recruited because, as you mentioned, they're looking for work and they're looking for a way out and they're also looking for something to believe in. And right. when they can't believe in good things, they end up being taught about bad things and they buy into that and see that as their way out of whatever their predicament is. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the problem with the way that uh, it was actually Marie Harf, a deputy State Department spokesperson, and she said this on Hardball on MSNBC. The problem with the way she presented it, it, it sounds a little fatuous. Um, unemployment leads to ISIS. If only we can give ISIS guys jobs, there will be no terrorism. And that's just false. The kernel of truth there is, as I mentioned, uh, there, there is a, an element of financial gain to joining ISIS either as a lieutenant or a rank-and-file infantryman or just a fellow traveler, someone who pledges allegiance to the organization because, frankly, you don't want to quarrel with them. Um, there was a study done in Camp Buka, which was the U.S.-run internment facility in Iraq. I think this was around 2007, uh, which showed that a lot of the guys in the prison who had been detained by American and coalition forces, said that the number one reason they were joining al-Qaeda in Iraq was money. This is the group that had the most cash, right? Um, so, yes, there, there is an element of, of a materialist incentive, if you like, to, to join with ISIS. That said, um, look at where they have superimposed their so-called caliphate on two countries that are completely ravaged by war, as far as I'm concerned, hopelessly dysfunctional, failed states. Uh, the least of the problems there is the jobless rate, right? I mean, you've got barrel bombs being dropped on people's heads in Syria. You have Shia death squads running around in Iraq committing ethnic cleansing if, they're, if you're not having also 
ISIS doing the same in reverse against the Shia and Christians and Yazidis. Um, it's not really about uh, you know in the employment stats at the moment. Um, you know, again, it's it's a mafia. So if a mafia comes in and says you pay us protection money and we'll protect you from the various nasties out there, even though we're nasty ourselves, you, you're going to cut a deal. So there is a lot of horse trading and sort of pragmatic deal making being struck and that that is leading to to ISIS's supremacy as well but look i mean if the president's goal is to say we need reform in the middle east well nice work if you can get it you know he's talking about spreading democracy well that means putting democracy in saudi arabia qatar kuwait the united arab emirates uh, and all over the the region i mean <laughs> it's just not going to happen anytime soon so we have to be a little more realistic and sober in how we assess this problem yeah the the whole notion of exporting democracy has been uh, a fool's folly uh, particularly when it comes to the middle east for generations now and uh, i don't think that this administration or the next one or the previous one had any chance of of changing that now when we talk about isis and uh, their outgrowth from al qaeda and the baathists of saddam hussein regime, we are seeing what seems to be more brutality. And I say what seems to be because ISIS likes to put those videos out of them beheading people. Right. Uh, we did not have a slick propaganda machine from their forebears in Al-Qaeda. Is ISIS just better at that? They're better at, the, at the, the propaganda and the dissemination of their atrocities, for sure. But you're quite right to say it's what seems to be more brutality. Let's, let's take everything that ISIS does one by one. Uh, they are beheading people. Shia militias in Iraq are beheading people, too. They're just not advertising it. Actually, in some cases, they are. They're posting videos to Facebook, but the media is not seizing upon this as, as something of great moment and concern. Uh, they're setting people al alight in cages. Well, the Assad regime, according to a study which came out this week, backed by an Iranian-built militia group or super militia called the National Defense Forces, has set alight uh, some 80-plus people in their houses, locked them in their houses and burnt the places to the ground, including women and children. The difference is the Syrian state media apparatus doesn't broadcast these images on television. So ISIS, it is using these, these snuff videos, it is using its, its, its horrifying brutality as a method of recruitment. And now people in the West, they scratch their heads and they say, well, hang on, I look at these videos and I'm horrified, I want nothing to do with such an organization. Sure, but if you're a jihadi, or even if you're not, even if you're somebody who just sees what's been happening to your Sunni, you know, your Sunni co-religionists over the past hell decade, um, the people that are being, uh, th that these offenses and these atrocities are being committed against, uh, ISIS depicts them as apostates, infidels, devil worshippers, whatever. Uh, so again, you're, they're tapping into a sort of uh, cultural and religious sensitivity and vulnerability. And a lot of people we interviewed for the book who went off to join ISIS, these guys didn't start out as psychopaths. We talked to their family members as well. Uh, one guy is a Bahraini, actually he's Syrian by heritage, but he lived in Bahrain, called Abdelaziz. We opened the book with this anecdote. He went over to Syria, joined the Free Syrian Army at the end of 2011, didn't like them very much, migrated into other Islamist factions, didn't like them, went back to Bahrain, linked up with the ISIS guys over Skype, uh, they convinced him to come back to Syria, and he did, and then they just kind of built him up in their own image. They, they brainwashed him. And then he went off and he beheaded people, and he took a sex slave from you know, a Yazidi girl when he went into the Battle of Sinjar. And the way he talked about these things, he justified them as though this was perfectly legitimate, according to some very draconian uh, you know, law or, or, or central tenets of war that ISIS has indoctrinated in him. So... Again, you know, it's easy to say, well, it's the Middle East and it's Islam and, you know, it's all just a kind of pig's breakfast over there. But look at modern history. I mean, totalitarian movements have happened in Europe. Uh, you know, Hitler presented a death cult and millions of Germans bowed down before him, uh, you know, welcoming that instead of liberal democracy. So there's something ingrained in human nature that has to be addressed here as to why people are drawn to these images and, and, and these acts of ultraviolence and this messianic ideology, which does. It, I mean, Graham's piece is quite right in that there is an apocalyptic end goal that is being sold. The real question, though, is are the people controlling ISIS, are they really trying to usher in the end of the world? Do they believe their own shtick? I don't think that a lot of them do. I think they're just doing it because, um, as I say, this is, this is about the restoration of, of lost political prestige. And, uh, you know, the guys that they're, they're drawing in from all over the world, from Belgium, the UK, the United States, uh, this is cannon fodder. These are the guys that are going to be strapped with suicide bombs and sent to some checkpoint. 
They're not going to be platoon commanders or generals in, in the ISIS army. This is the Big 550 KTRS. Paul Harris talking with Michael Weiss, who is co-author with Hassan Hassan of ISIS, Inside the Army of Terror. Uh, I'm sure you've heard this. I know I've heard it from a lot of people. Every time one of those execution videos, a beheading video, is put out there on YouTube and then shown by American media, which I think is a ridiculous thing to do. Uh, but every time one of those shows up, somebody I know says, why don't we just bomb these people off the face of the planet? That's not even possible, is it? No. Um, and, and when you say these people, what are you talking about? Are you talking about the, you know, the upper cadres of ISIS? I mean, the United States has a kill list of people they want to you know, take off the battlefield by force, including Baghdadi himself, very well. But what about the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that ISIS is now quote-unquote governing or, or ruling? Are we going to just bomb them into smithereens? If you do that, um, I got news for you. Um, you will legitimate ISIS's thesis, which is that uh, this is a war against Sunni Islam because these are Sunnis that they're, they're ruling in, in, in most cases. So, no, I mean, and there is, again, it, you know, wrapped in the kind of, you know, warm and fuzzy platitudinousness of what Obama has said at this conference, there are grains of truth. Um, there is a sociopolitical component or, or sort of fundamental uh, basis that needs to be addressed, in, you know, as, as part of this so-called strategy to de degrade and then defeat ISIS. The problem I have with the current strategy is that we're doing everything wrong. You know, the U.S. has more or less inaugurated this de facto alliance or entente cordiale with Iran. Uh, so we're, we're turning a blind eye and we're acquiesce, acquiescing to the Hezbollah, Hezbollahization of the security services in Syria and the security services in Iraq. This plays right into ISIS's propaganda. Again, their, their thing is there is a crusader Jewish Rafida conspiracy. Crusaders are us the United States, Western Europe, the Jews are the Jews and Israel. The Rafida is a derogatory term for the Shia. So, you know, we are giving the appearance, geopolitically speaking, of doing everything that ISIS accuses us of doing. Now, it doesn't matter that it's not true. The United States has no intention to murder and, and dispossess and ethnically cleanse Sunnis. However, if you're living on the ground and you see what's happening and, you know, the U.S. is condemning ISIS barbarism, but they're not condemning the barbarism being committed by the Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran or the Badr Corps or Asayib al-Haq or Khatib Hezbollah or all these other groups running around in, in Iraq and sometimes in Syria too, uh, you know, then there's a double standard. And if you're a Sunni, you see the double standard and you say, death to America. I'd, I'd rather cut my lot with uh, or cast my lot with ISIS. This is the problem. This is why they've been so successful. It sounds to me like if we were to follow the instructions of a certain loudmouth TV news personality and declare a holy war against ISIS, etc., we'd be jumping right into the barrel they want us in. Absolutely, absolutely. Look, um, most Muslim Al Azhar, which is the the center, the I mean, the, the mothership of Islamic theological thought, based in Cairo. They came out, their clerics, and said. Um, ISIS should be drawn and quartered and crucified. They, this is a perversion. This is a, a degradation of Islam. Bravo. Well said. And most Muslims would agree with that sentiment. The problem is, um, if you look at de-radicalization programs over time, uh, Camp Buka, again, a U.S.-run detention facility. I interview in the book uh, Major General Doug Stone, who ran that prison for about 18 months. He told me, in the prison, we had moderate imams come in and preach the true Islam, you know, reconciled with modernity, democracy, and the rest of it. And then Al-Qaeda in Iraq had their clerics come in and not only preach the, the Salafi jihadi version of Islam, but turn secular or nationalist insurgents, people who were even picked up for petty crimes like theft or, or you know, uh, uh, stealing cars or whatever, turn them into jihadis. Guess who was more successful? It wasn't the moderate imams. Another anecdote I can tell you is this. There, there's, uh, we, we interview an anthropologist by the name of Scott Atran, who teaches at the University of Michigan. He told me uh, he knows a Spanish imam, a very moderate guy, I mean, you know, celebrated throughout Spain and, you know, the kind of person that President Obama would love to have preaching this, this uh, you know, this, this mainstream interpretation of the faith. And this guy admitted that, look, every time he hears the caliphate has been established, the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. Not because he has an ISIS ideal ideological bent, but because, again, they are tapping into this, you know, his, the, the, this, this lost and historical glory. Um, and so, yes, for the West to say anything along the lines of crusade or holy war, I mean, that is the height of stupidity. That's exactly what they want to hear. That's exactly going to be bu built right into their, their recruitment effort. It already is. 
The book is a primer for people who need to know more about ISIS and uh, what they do and who they are and what they have done and, and, and how to uh, perhaps take them on uh, going forward. It is called ISIS Inside the Army of Terror. Michael Weiss, thank you so much for joining me here today. Sure, thanks for having me on. I'm Paul Harris. This is the Big 550 KTRS. This is McGraw Live on KPLR 11.2, stltoday.com, and the Big 550 KTRS. I'm Frank. I'm Kevin. Join Frank and Kevin on the Big Barbecue Show every